we began a discourse on the true history of your planet. But we didn't get very far, only to the point where the humanoid form began propagating throughout the universe. This form you have come to know so well with its arms, legs, torso, head, etc. was the result of genetic experimentation and research compromising a very long period of time, about 900 million of your Earth years. During that time, all manner of exotic life forms were created by permutating the DNA strands and structures. Most of the animal life you are familiar with was brought forth as a side effect of this research. Forgive us, but we are going to back up a bit. This is a vast subject to most of your peoples, and we do not want to leave anything out. Life exists in many forms, some of which you would not recognize if it were right in front of you. There are carbon-based life forms, silicon-based life forms, and even lithium-based life forms. These are sentient beings with at least a rudimentary understanding and awareness of their presence and the love of the Creator. All life began in the simplest of states. Even hydrogen has a level of awareness. The Creator, in the form of us, began experimenting with different life forms. We found we could take the rudimentary consciousness of a hydrogen atom or a heavier metallic element and permutate the atomic structure, thus creating new and varying forms of life. All life forms we created had a natural tendency to become more organized over time and more sophisticated, gradually growing in self-awareness. The natural evolution of life forms followed what you call the Darwinian evolutionary model. All of our experiments and the experiments of other groups like us were represented by mutations or periods punctuated with intense growth and alteration of form and structure. Your scientists do not understand why there are so many mutations and alterations in living organisms. We are offering an explanation. As life began evolving from first density up the various mineral and plant stages, there eventually came a level of sophistication and awareness known as the animal stage, wherein it became possible for the higher density souls to incarnate directly into the flesh and blood of these evolving life forms. This is the part that is hard to understand for most of you, but it is as if a tiny fragment of yourself, the animal consciousness, was reunited with the larger part of yourself your 7D consciousness, to incarnate into an animal form. The tiny aspect, the consciousness of the animal, would have to merge with the larger aspect, the consciousness of the incarnating soul. The cosmic inbreath involves the merging and assimilating of soul fragments into larger and larger conglomerations of consciousness. Incarnation is one way this process is accomplished. The pinnacle of this evolutionary process is the humanoid form. This humanoid form you find yourselves embodying was originally designed to be capable of experiencing seven different dimensions simultaneously. It had the capability to sit, stand, walk, run, leap, fly, and, and teleport itself from one place to another. All of these were considered valuable experiences of physicality and ether reality. For this body you inhabit was quasi-physical in the sense that it could be made translucent and fluid, or it could be as solid as you experience it now. This body was designed specifically to work with the gravitational and electromagnetic fields of evolving planets, and its density could be shifted at will from the first through seventh level. During the 900 million year period of experimentation, there were many strange and exotic forms walking upon your planet. You are familiar with some of them, including the dinosaurs. These DNA forms were created as byproducts of our research and the research of other groups who worked with us. There was a period known in your mythology as the Land of Pan. 
This civilization took place near the beginning of the 100 million year cycle, which is, incidentally, about one half of a revolution of your sun around the central sun of your galaxy. During the time of Pan, or Pangaea as it is sometimes called, the DNA experimentation was still going on and there were no safeguards built into the Earth laboratory. This meant that various life forms could interbreed and create other exotic blends and hybrids. You are perhaps familiar with the Pegasus and Centaur and other creatures resembling a cross between horses and man or horses and angels. There were many bizarre creatures roaming your world, all a product of genetic experimentation and interspecies breeding. Embedded within the genetic codes of every species was the infinite creator's plan of evolution, known as the inbreath of creation. The inbreath of creation issues forth the universal law of increasing intelligence and self-awareness. All life forms during the inbreath have a blueprint of ascension along the evolutionary spiral, and so as the bizarre life forms of Pan began to grow in awareness, they developed various levels of judgement and discernment through various mental and emotional faculties. They began to become aware of their creator, and they also began to become aware that they were spirits embedded in various physical and etheric forms. As sparks of the original undifferentiated source energy, they felt a longing to return to that source. They began to realise that a part of that source had split off from the vastness of love and light and was going through this outer experience of embodiment. This is the allegorical reference to the tree of knowledge of good and evil in your religious teachings. These life forms were given a realm of creation in which to learn how to become gods in their own right. This realm is known as the fourth dimension, or the realm of mind and knowledge and imagination. Within the blueprint of every life form is the desire to create like the creator, just as within every child born of a human parent are the potentialities, hopes and desires of the parents. Every spark of divinity, as it experienced the various physical embodiments and species, was also developing its desire to become a creator. The infinite creator made a decision a long time ago in earthy terms to place no limits on what could be created by its fledging children. This was known as the law of free will and this law has been the source of all pain and misery upon your world and countless others. The creator gave each one of you the ability to create, unlike the perfect blueprint. Within your fourth dimensional canvas, you could paint any picture you desired, from the lovely to the grotesque. The creator wanted to experience every conceivable idea and see it manifest on the canvas of the imagination. And so it is that many of the creator's fledgling life forms experimented with their own DNA to the point of creating mishappen, malformed and convoluted creatures with similar convoluted mental processes. Many of the sparks of divinity, souls, who ventured into these uncharted realms became so mesmerised by their own creations that they forgot they were seventh density beings of the creator's light and love. As they became more and more immersed in these lower densities, they became identified with the physicality and ether reality of these realms. This is referred to in your religious teachings as the original fall from grace. A popular present day analogy on your world would be the experience of going into a movie theatre. When you are deeply engrossed in the movie, you forget about the outside world until the movie is over and then you wander dazed and confused out of the movie theatre, slowly piecing together the reality you left just two hours earlier. However, in the case of your fall, the two hours is more like 100 million years. So, beloveds, we have two processes unfolding here. The first is the process of evolution, 
from a tiny spark of divinity that begins as inanimate objects of the first density and slowly evolves through more and more sophisticated levels of genetic configurations, eventually making its way back to the godhead. Then, at the same time, we have the process of devolution, wherein souls differentiate out of the godhead as twelfth density beings of light and gradually drop their vibration down until they reach the seventh density, wherein they take the form of luminous beings of light. It is at that point that they then differentiate further through the process of incarnation until they are able to experience all the levels of evolution, from a grain of sand to the source from whence they came. There have been four major civilizations and a lot of minor ones on your planet since the grand experiment began unfolding here. 1. Pangaea 2. Lemuria 3. Atlantis and 4. The Present In addition, there have been two major events in your solar system that dramatically impacted the history of your world. A. The destruction of Maldek and B. The destruction of the surface of Mars we are simplifying the story considerably because there were numerous other events, some of which we will be going into in detail. These would include what your religious writings call the Luciferian Rebellion, which we refer to as the Orion Invasion, the infusion of the Alpha Draconians, Reptilians, the reign of the Syrians, your biblical and pre-biblical times, and the quiet invasion of the Zeta Reticulins, Greys. Keep in mind that these are the only major ET infusions. There were many others, including input from certain Andromedan sectors, various levels and dimensions of Pleiadian groups, Venusians, Arcturians, Antarians, and others from Polaris, Alpha Centauri, and many other regions. Add to this the overseeing of your progress by the councils of Al Sion, the Great White Brotherhood, the Confederations of Light and their offshoots, Ashtar, Solar Cross, etc., and the many interplanetary priesthoods, Melchizedek, Metatron, Enoch, etc., and you have quite a bowl of porridge on the cosmic stove. Well, as you say, let's get on with it. Let's start with Pangaea but let's put it into the historic timeline. The land of Pan was the pinnacle of success regarding the experimentation and interbreeding of various DNA strains. This was the paradise or Garden of Eden written about in your religious books. Most of the earth was tropical jungle during the period from 200 million to 20 million years ago. You can see evidence of this by examining the geological formations, particularly in your desert areas. For example, the barren desert known as the Petrified Forest in northeastern Arizona was once dense jungle. Many areas, including your favourite hotspot, Sedona, was underwater for much of that time. In other words, your world was bathed in water and dense vegetation. In most areas, even the polar regions were teeming with life. The humanoid form was seeded on your planet approximately 100 million years ago, right in the middle of this jungle period. There were small groups of humanoids confined to relatively small areas of your world. These humanoids were seventh density beings with wings and highly developed telepathic and psychic abilities. They lived in paradise they were loving and cooperative and communicated with the exotic plant and animal life that abounded everywhere. They extracted their food directly from sunlight and assimilated water through their pores. They had need of nothing but each other. This is a rough equivalent of what you call the Garden of Eden in your religious writings. The life forms during that time were varied and plentiful. About 60 million years ago, the dinosaurs were killed off when the comet Arunhatak 
made its 10,500 year cycle and came too close to Earth on this particular pass. The resulting cooldown destroyed a large part of the vegetation, but the Earth in her amazing regenerative ways was able to bounce back and another fertile period ensued. There were only a few hundred thousand humanoid forms on Earth at that time, and most of them retreated underground, and, with the help of various Pleiadean factions, created a subterranean world of great beauty and intricacy. This is where the legends of an inner Earth came from. Most of the life forms of Pan were exotic and do not exist today. These are legends of a few of them, including the Pegasus and Centaur, no relation to Alpha Centurions, and some of the creatures were descendants of the dinosaurs and early reptiles. The dragons got their folklore from two sources, Pangaea and the Draconian invasion. The early dragons were reptilian creatures that evolved along with the dinosaurs and were genetically manipulated by us and other ET groups. Later, the Draconians came to Earth with their own reptilian form and began interbreeding and creating exotic dragon forms. The fall of Pangaea was the original fall from grace as chronicled in your writings. This occurred when the Sons of God, the seventh density Pleiadians, incarnated into the human forms evolving on Earth and forgot their divine connection. The humanoid forms, before the incarnation of the seventh density Pleiadians, had a rudimentary consciousness somewhere between second and third density. Your evolutionary scientists see the change brought about by the Pleiadian incarnations as an unexplained mutation that marks the difference between apes and humans. The incarnated Pleiadian humans interbred with the various creatures, hence the half-horse, half-man, and many others. The Fairy Kingdom was one of the offshoots of this interbreeding. Seventh Density Souls took on a human form that had wings. When they interbred with the four-legged creatures, one of the results was the Pegasus, or winged horse. As the humanoid Pleiadian souls dropped in vibration, their wings became atrophied, along with their telepathic and other abilities. They became more and more like the creatures evolving on Earth, more animalistic in nature and less able to formulate higher intellectual reasoning abilities. All this continued until approximately 10 million years ago, when the end of the cosmic cycle occurred and the electromagnetic polarities shifted. At that time, great storms raged across the Earth. As a result of the changing EM frequencies, a flood wiped out most of the creatures residing on Earth. This is referred to in your religious writings as the Great Flood. At that time, most of the Earth became covered in water, with a few remnants of land and life remaining here and there. At any rate, today we examine the major wars and infusions of souls onto your world that mark the beginning of what you call violence and conflict. For many of you, this will not be a pretty picture, but I suspect many of you are mature souls now and can handle a little unpleasantry amidst all the glorious creation. Your Earth was not the only planet in your system that received ET attention. Ten million years ago, there were three planets that harboured life forms: Earth, Mars and Maldek. These were the third, fourth and fifth planets from your Sun at the time. Yes, the environment on the fourth and fifth planets was colder and less hospitable than on Earth, but that did not stop the ETs from colonising these worlds. Those that came to Mars and Maldek were adventurous sorts, willing to endure the harsh winters and barren landscapes that dotted these planets. Although there were forests and plant life in the equatorial regions, and plenty of water and ice in the polar regions. Many of those souls that perished during the Great Flood of Earth reincarnated on Mars and Maldek. The civilizations already developing on those worlds 
were from many different star systems, and now the Pleiadian root race joined the mix. As you can imagine, the beings now residing on those worlds had dropped in vibration to the fourth density. Souls born into a fourth density world did not receive the same kind of loving attention that souls in seventh density experience. These outer planets were therefore a repository for a bizarre array of thought forms and thought creations, thereby resulting in a rich and varied astral realm, the realm of thought creation, imagination, and the dream state. Throughout this period, many beings from across the galaxy had taken notice of the Earth experiment and its neighbouring planets. A group of souls from the Draco star system sent scout craft to Earth about 40 million years ago, and again roughly 1 or 2 million years before the Great Flood, about 12 million years ago. Although they did not settle on mass, their reports back to the Draconian Councils put Earth, Mars and Maldek on the map for exploration and possible conquest. Another group from the constellation of Orion also took notice of the fledging Earth souls and their compatriots on Mars and Maldek. We of the 7th and 12th densities were still monitoring the Earth experiment closely, and these less than savoury civilizations from Orion and Draco were not able to gain a foothold on Earth due to our careful observation. It would have been like marching into a laboratory and announcing they were taking over the experiment. We had a protective vibration around Earth, and things like this didn't happen. At least, not at that time. However, the same protections were not afforded Mars and Maldek because, quite frankly, that was not our terrain. These planets were more of a free-for-all, and so come they did, in small numbers at first, as scouts and small settlements amidst the existing communities. Once interbreeding began to occur, the souls from Orion and Draco began incarnating as well. The Draco reptilian form found it hard to adapt to the Mars and Maldek environments, and reincarnation became the preferred method of infusing oneself into these worlds. Both the Orion and Draco systems had a wide variety of conscious beings, and the explorers who settled on Mars and Maldek were quite aggressive and warrior-like in their mentality. Their main purpose in coming to Earth's solar system was conquest and mining of natural resources, basically anything that would give them power and prestige. These souls had long ago forgotten their connection to Source and felt they needed to take from others in order to feel whole and complete. It was not long before war started to break out on Mars and Maldek. Due to Mars's proximity to Earth and the watchful gaze of our members, the Orions and Draconians were less willing to reincarnate in mass numbers on Mars. They preferred the relative distance of Maldek. They began coming in record numbers, and pretty soon the Maldekian civilization numbered in millions of souls. They built great cities out of stone, and in matching their consciousness, these cities had great fortresses and towers to afford protection from attack. At some point, the Maldekian peoples discovered neutron technology and began manufacturing bombs and wartime implements. At that time, several million years ago, there were no safeguards in place to prevent the runaway consequences of this technology. Although the Maldekian civilization began over 10 million years ago in Earth time, it continued to evolve into a series of warring factions. This warring attracted the attention of both benevolent and malevolent ET groups from various systems around the galaxy, but because of the non-interference agreement and protection of free will, little was done to intervene. About 3,200,000 years ago, and the neutron weapons were deployed, it was supposed to be a limited nuclear exchange between two of the warring factions. At this point, the DNA of the souls were a mixture of Draconian and Orion strands, both of which contained the aggressive genes. Each side in this conflict, although both sides had similar DNA, 
wanted to outdo the other, and the weapons grew increasingly larger and more numerous. The first exchange only destroyed a few thousand humanoids. The side most damaged would rebuild and retaliate, each time with greater devastation. Although it seemed to be discovered by accident, a particularly powerful neutron bomb was developed using a rare combination of elemental catalysts. The scientists involved in its development did not realise the extent of its destructive capabilities. This weapon was fired at a military base hidden underground in enemy territory. Within this base were hundreds of neutron weapons. The enemy, realising the bomb was coming, attempted to get their base weapons airborne. Several dozen of the several hundred weapons were launched and exploded in the sky, creating a brilliant flash. However, they were unable to intercept the oncoming, more powerful weapon, and it entered the silos of the enemy and simultaneously ignited over 200 weapons buried in the ground. The combination of the explosion of the more powerful weapon and the 200 conventional nuclear weapons resulted in a powerful earthquake that tore apart the planet of Maldek and eventually broke it into hundreds of fragments, which became the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Over 10 million souls perished in the blast, and these souls later reincarnated on Mars. We and the other benevolent groups were horrified at what happened and petitioned the Godhead for a greater level of intervention to prevent this from ever happening again. The resulting blast altered the orbits of Mars and Earth and severely disrupted the etheric bases on Jupiter and Saturn. A wave of electromagnetic disruption went out from the solar system and beings from all over the galaxy took notice. A council was convened in the Alcyon system, home of the Great White Brotherhood, and it was established that no more complete planetary destruction would be allowed anywhere in the galaxy. Over 10 million souls lost their bodies during the destruction of Maldek. Most of these souls took up residence on Mars where a civilization was already in progress. The souls on Mars at that time were a product of our experimentation, along with groups from many different systems, including Orion and Alpha Draconis. Those groups left their mark many times along your evolutionary spiral, but never to a sufficient degree as to seriously alter your DNA blueprint, at least not yet. The souls from Maldek incarnated in the usual manner through among the Pleiadian, Orion and Draconian lineage of Mars. The civilization on Mars grew significantly in numbers until there were over 100 million souls. That the 10 million souls from Maldek fragmented into approximately 50% of the Mars population within a period of only a few thousand years. As the population grew on Mars, the fragile atmosphere became strained. Due to their distance from the Sun, both Mars and Maldek had thin and delicate atmospheres that could not take the strain of large populations not to mention nuclear weapons. As the Mars civilization continued to grow, unrest between the various factions grew, especially since many of the Maldekian souls had not learned the lessons of war and had left their bodies suddenly during the catastrophic events there. Although most souls are counseled in between lifetimes, there was still a policy of non-interference, except to prevent another planetary explosion and so Mars's inhabitants were pretty much left on their own as long as they did not develop weapons sufficient to destroy the entire planet. The explosion of Maldek had altered the orbit of Mars and changed the EM frequency band significantly. The climate changed and great canals were built to transport water from the tropical and polar regions into the desert intermediate zones. As the climate continued to become more unstable, wars broke out over water rights and eventually conventional weapons began proliferating. A form of dirty atomic bombs were developed using heavy metals, uranium, plutonium, etc. 
and a war broke out using these weapons. Many souls were warned by members of the Brotherhood of Light, later the Confederation of Planets, and were assisted in building underground shelters and eventually underground cities. The Brotherhood and its related organisations neutralised many of the weapons to prevent a repeat of the Maldek experience. Nevertheless, the Martians blew holes in their atmosphere and severely disrupted the ecological balance to the point of rendering most surface life forms extinct. Some survivors of the atomic bomb blasts made their way underground and joined those already there. Once underground, they continued to rebuild their civilization until a new level of order emerged. Of the approximately 100 million surface souls, about 10 million survived and went underground. To prevent further attacks, the underground cities of Mars were sealed off from the outside world and scientists managed to create an artificial environment capable of sustaining up to 20 million souls. Over time, great dust storms spread across the surface of Mars and eroded most of the cities and their architecture. Remaining to this day are a few pyramids and rectangular buildings, enough to remind your scientists that there was once life there, although such information has been suppressed from the populace. As for the underground cities, they still exist and are still inhabited to this day, but have evolved into fourth density and are not visible to most people who inquire. Your scientists will discover some radioactivity on Mars that cannot be explained solely by natural rock formations. This is the residue of the atomic explosions, since some of the elements used have a half-life of millions of years. What happened to the 90 million or so souls that did not go underground? You guessed it, they migrated to Earth and reincarnated into the melting pot of Pleiadean, Orion, Draconian and other groups that had reorganised since the destruction of Pan. Today's discourse begins a new level of information that comes with a disclaimer. The material given in this discourse and the ones that follow is based on information that has been heavily suppressed by certain powers and influences that have been in control of your planet for a very long time. It is our intention to reveal the information that has been suppressed and to do so in the clearest and most accurate way possible. We are not aware of any souls in earthly embodiment that have disseminated this information in the past with 100% accuracy. This is due to the difficulty involved in extracting the information from the Akashic records. Although all information in the universe is freely available to anyone who sincerely requests it, only those souls that are no longer able to be influenced by the councils of Rigel and the Draconian councils have been successful in getting through the system of distortion placed in the ethers about your planet. In some of your channeled writings, this etheric distortion is referred to as the frequency barrier. Until recently, we have not been allowed by the Godhead to tamper with this etheric distortion field. It has only been since about 1950 AD in your timeline that divine intervention has included the ability to remove etheric distortion fields from your planetary sphere. The ancient mystery schools existing at various times on your planet were set up primarily to move souls along the spiritual path to the point of being able to access these stargates and portals. The system of initiations and rituals given through such secret and not-so-secret orders as the Brotherhood of Masons, the Rosy Cross, Rosicrucians, the Order of the White Rose and the Order of the Purple Rose were for the express purpose of teaching souls to pierce the veils. In the beginning of these organisations, a number of souls attained knowledge of the stargates and portals and were able to pierce some of the veils. However, 
these souls were not evolved spiritually to the point of being able to remain pure in heart and mind, and many misused the information given. Due to lack of discernment, they gave the DNA codes to various negatively polarized ET groups, which enabled these groups to enter the stargates and portals and wreak havoc in the astral and etheric planes of Earth. These entities merged their DNA codes with the codes of evolving Earth souls, both directly through energy transmissions and through mass incarnations, thereby corrupting the original intent of the secret and not-so-secret mystical orders. All of the mystery schools mentioned above, and several others, have been infiltrated by negatively polarized ET factions, and as a result, the leaders of these organizations are controlled largely by the ego-based desire for power and control over others. This ego-based lust for power and control can be very devious and subtle, masquerading as one-upmanship and spiritual pride at having achieved this level or that level in the organization. With each level attained, the individual accumulates a greater degree of responsibility for the functioning of the organization and regulation of its members. This is especially dangerous when the ego is in charge. There have been numerous well-meaning world leaders who have gotten caught up in these negatively polarized energy fields, while still believing they are doing the work of God. This is one of the reasons certain elements of this information have not been revealed until this time. We, the founders, are confident that there are now enough souls pure in heart and mind that would not, under any circumstances, misuse the information that we are giving it through several channels at this time, including this one. We are not giving actual DNA code configurations during this current transmission, but we are giving the energy patterns necessary to pierce the veils. Some souls who attune to these messages will be sufficiently evolved to be able to pierce the veils directly. Others will need the proper DNA keys and codes, which will be given later. It is not our intent to withhold any information that is needed by your planetary light workers. However, even at our level of awareness and vibration, we have made what you would call errors of judgment in times past that partially led to the current situation on Earth. To the best of our knowledge, there are no ET groups or channeled entities that are immune to these errors of judgment. Free will is a complicated and challenging principle at all levels of evolution. While we thoroughly understand the mechanics of free will, we use the utmost caution and respect when making decisions that affect the free will of millions of Earth souls. Up until about 1950 AD, there were virtually no controls in place to prevent the light and dark factions from battling it out to the bitter end. With the advent of nuclear weaponry, all that changed, and the Godhead issued the decree of divine intervention that most of you know about, allowing direct intervention in certain matters, when it was determined that such intervention would prevent the violation of free will of a large number of Earth souls. Once souls on your planet reach an inner vibratory rate of fifth density awareness, their well-being is protected by our dispensations as carried out faithfully according to divine principle. One of your scientists, a Dr. Hawkins, devised a vibratory scale that is rather crude but somewhat useful, and we will use that scale to make our point here. Those souls whose inner calibration level is 500 or above, or whose outer calibration level is 400 or above, automatically enter a protective field of energy generated by our members and certain other high-density groups involved in implementing the divine dispensation. At this time, 
there are approximately 16 million souls on your planet vibrating at or above the levels indicated. Keep in mind, beloved creators, this is not a pecking order or device with which to feel more or less worthy. All of God's creations are worthy. Everyone on your planet deserves God's love. There is not one soul unworthy of being saved. Anyway, this is not about being saved. This is about being granted access to the stargates and portals necessary to assist humanity in breaking free of the effects of the Luciferian Rebellion, which we shall discuss in a moment. Only those souls with pure minds and hearts are being allowed to access the sacred DNA keys and codes and enter the stargates and portals responsible for maintaining the veils of illusion on your planet. Any soul who sincerely desires to be free can and will be free. This is divine law. Ask and ye shall receive is as valid today as it was in the time of Jesus. However, there are certain safeguards built in to the ethers and astral regions of your planet that were necessary in order to respect the free will of souls evolving on your world. The pre-Lemurian period on your world corresponds roughly to 10 million BC until about 1 million BC. During that time, your world slowly recovered from the Great Flood and life forms began to proliferate once again. After the destruction of Maldek and the atmosphere of Mars, many of those souls came to Earth and reincarnated, dramatically raising the population. Earth was once again mainly a tropical jungle, with about 90% water cover and only the polar regions were cooled by comparison. Like attracts like, and as the souls from Maldek and Mars continued coming to Earth, the vibratory rate of Earth dropped to match their vibrations. When the awareness level of Earth dropped below fifth density, souls from neighbouring systems were able to access the stargates and portals surrounding Earth, which were not regulated at that time except by the law of attraction. Although the Orions and Draconians already had a foothold on Earth, they came by leaps and bounds once the vibration dropped below fifth density. Up until about one half million years ago in your timeline, Earth continued to attract more and more souls from across the universe. The vibratory level of these souls was generally fourth density, meaning that they were subject to the astral and etheric distortions inherent within that level of vibration. The genetics were now a blend of many races, but the Orions gradually began to dominate. War between Rigel and Betelguise had made life rather intolerable for many Orions, and Earth was seen as a place to begin life anew. Unlike the Dracos, the Orions were able to easily land directly on the Earth, in addition to coming through the incarnational process and so their numbers increased significantly faster than the Dracos, whose reptilian bodies had a hard time adjusting to Earth's atmosphere and gravity. We, the Founders, observed with dismay what was going on, but because we were not allowed to interfere, we were like lab technicians watching a specimen multiply out of control and doing nothing to contain it. A group of archangels and ascended beings from 7th, 8th and 9th density were also watching the Earth. Several of these beings are well known to Earth's people, including Archangel Michael. An ascended being that was later given the name Lucifer was among those watching the progress of Earth. Lucifer devised a plan to lessen the chaos on Earth by teaching Earth souls how to control their emotions and use their intellectual capabilities, so they would not be as easily swayed by the negatively polarised factions. Lucifer mistakenly attributed the decaying situation on Earth to unbridled emotions and passion. A group of souls headed by Lucifer came to Earth and established a series of mystery schools 
designed to train souls in suppressing and controlling the emotional body. The plan backfired, because as the students learned to suppress their emotions, their souls became more and more fragmented until their vibration dropped below fourth density into third density. Suppressing any part of the self results in a loss of power and awareness. The shaming of emotion in men, the Victorian suppression of sexual desire and the making of feelings wrong all had their origins in Lucifer's philosophy. Archangel Michael, seeing what was happening on Earth, found that he could sit by no longer, simply watching. And so he headed a group of ascended beings who voluntarily dropped their vibration and came to Earth, establishing another mystery school designed to raise the vibrations of souls back into the light. Once Michael and his group arrived on Earth, the vibrations were so dense that he and his band of celestial helpers became caught in the game of duality and started seeing the negatively orientated factions as evil forces to overcome. Thus, these angels reinforce the concept of light versus dark on your world. Michael took the side of the light, and many members of the Councils of Rigel, as well as most of the Dracos, took the polarity of the dark. Meanwhile, Lucifer and his group maintained their cool, calm aloofness, becoming armchair strategists, watching with interest the battles taking shape. He became so fascinated with this drama of duality that he began building up both sides, through training the light and dark forces to fight each other in the interests of seeing who would be supreme victors. The missing ingredient in all of this was compassion. Lucifer taught the soldiers on the battlefield to suppress their emotions and become hardened to misery and suffering. Archangel Michael taught the soldiers to be passionate and forceful in overcoming the dark forces. When Lucifer saw what Michael was doing, he turned his attention from the Orions and waged war on Michael's forces, and a great battle ensued in the astral and etheric planes above Earth. This became known as the War in the Heavens. Michael's forces were passionate about becoming victors over darkness. Lucifer's forces were cool, calm, and intellectual, and waged their wars through cunning strategy. The third force in all this, the negatively polarized Orions and Draconians, proliferated as their primary foes were now at war with each other. War in the heavens lasted about a thousand years, taking place in roughly 500,000 BC. During the period from 1 million BC until 500,000 BC, the population of Earth grew from about 200 million to almost a billion people. Because the wars were largely off-planet and did not significantly impact the surface of the Earth or the subterranean cultures, the population did not drop that much during the Luciferian Rebellion. Most of the surface fighting was regional and involved conventional weapons. After about 1,000 years of fighting, a truce was declared and Lucifer and his group agreed not to promote overt aggression against anyone in the Earth system. Michael realized the futility of fighting the darkness and also the futility of trying to overcome the suppression of emotional energy by force and withdrew back into the celestial realms to integrate the lessons learned. Between 500,000 BC and 200,000 BC, life gradually evolved on Earth, and a few souls recaptured their fourth density awareness and began learning how to live cooperatively. During this same period, many more souls came from all over the galaxy, and Earth truly became a melting pot. However, the biggest groups were still the Orions from the Betelguise and Rigel. During the Luciferian Rebellion, the Councils of Betelguise sided with Michael and the Light Forces, while the Councils of Rigel sided with the Dark Forces. Although there was very little overt hostility during the 
transition time following the rebellion, both Orion groups generally confined their breeding to their respective polarities, thereby retaining their DNA structure. The Betelguese factions remained more peaceful, while the Rigel fractions continued to be domineering and aggressive. The pinnacle of population during these times reached almost one and a half billion just before a grand cycle around 200,000 BC. The first period of Lemuria started at about 200,000 BC, after one of the grand cycles of 25,920 years had completed. This particular shift wiped out about half of Earth's population through massive earthquakes. The EM shift caused certain lands to break up and move apart, and one landmass became particularly fertile ground for the development of a rather benign civilization. Souls who were attracted to this landmass were generally peaceful people, some originating in the Pleiadian sector, and some from Sirius and Orion. This continent became roughly the size of Australia, and was located almost on the same longitude, but a bit further north. What most historians do not realise is that civilization continued on the other continents during the first period of Lemuria. Even though the vibration of the other continents was not as refined as it was on Lemuria, this first Lemurian civilization was later called the Land of Mu. It consisted of nearly half a billion souls at its pinnacle. About three grand cycles later, the EM fluctuations were such that another catastrophe ensued, and all the landmasses except Lemuria became flooded. Most of the souls who perished in the surrounding continents migrated, reincarnated, on Lemuria, and the population of Lemuria began to skyrocket. This became the second Lemurian period. This period was roughly from about 122,000 BC until about 100,000 BC. At the height of this second Lemurian civilization, the population again reached almost a billion people. These souls were not technologically orientated, but were tribal in nature, enjoying music and rhythm, and living in large cities along the coasts. Around 100,000 BC, the comet Ananhutak made a particularly close approach to Earth, and the tail brushed the atmosphere, causing dramatic cooling. The Lemurian people were used to the warm tropical climate, and all of a sudden the temperature dropped 50 degrees Fahrenheit in literally hours, freezing most of them. Those who knew what was coming fled to the sea, Many walked into the sea and drowned. A few tried to build undersea cities, but were largely unsuccessful. There are many legends of the sea that originated during this period. The Lemurian landmass eventually sank beneath the sea due to EM storms that followed the passage of the comet. There were only a handful of survivors, and they migrated to what is now South America and Australia, and later Hawaii and the Philippines. What has not been revealed before, and what has been heavily suppressed on Earth, is that the Alpha Draconians were behind the unusually close passage of the comet. Through a series of nuclear explosions in space, they deliberately forced the trajectory of the comet closer to Earth in order to destroy the civilizations there. The plan was to wipe out the existing life on Earth, and then land and claim the Earth for themselves. They were partially successful in this regard, but landing in their native bodies on Earth was a whole lot harder than incarnating into millions of already existing bodies. Suffice to say that they had a hard time surviving in their reptilian bodies, due to the unfavourable gravity and mixture of gases in the atmosphere. Their native bodies mutated and grew in size as they adapted, although their overall numbers remained small. This was the main period that gave rise to the legends of dragons roaming the Earth. The Draconians, not to be defeated that easily, 
spent long years in laboratories aboard their spacecraft, splicing and mutating various DNA samples until they came up with a human Draco hybrid. The secret involved injecting reptilian DNA into the cerebellum section of the brain, where it quickly mutated the entire system. This part of the human today is still called the reptilian brain. While the characteristics of this part involve aggressive and competitive behaviour and the fight or flight syndrome designed to protect the organism, these characteristics when combined with Orion DNA became especially potent and dominated the entire organism. Today about 80% of the DNA in humans is Orion in origin or maybe we should say Orion Draco hybrid. What is commonly thought to be human nature is the result of this DNA manipulation by the Draconians and subsequent incarnation by the Orions. As stated in this channel's earlier works, our original DNA blueprint that we were so proud of was reduced to less than 20% of the overall makeup of human beings. Due to the low survival rate of the Draconians after the destruction of Lemuria, the percentage of humans with true reptilian DNA on Earth has remained rather low. Most of the settling of Earth after 100,000 BC and before Atlantis was done by the councils of Rigel and councils of Betelguise from Orion. Note, long after the wars in the Orion sector came to an end, over 100,000 years ago, many of the factions that migrated to Earth continued to stay locked in battle mentally to the present day. As you can see by looking around, this trait ranges from civilised militarism and fervent patriotism to overt hostility and barbaric customs. We feel it important to add an explanation here regarding the veils and levels of distortion existing on and above your world during the transition from Lemuria to Atlantis. Both the Alpha Draconians and the Orions had fleets of ships orbiting the Earth during this period. The ships were largely in fourth density. The two groups had a loose alliance based on trading of technology in exchange for keeping hostilities at bay. One of the technologies they had developed was a high-intensity electromagnetic beam capable of disrupting the etheric fields around the Earth. In order to keep their enemies from coming to Earth, they created a force field using this technology. This field not only kept incoming ET groups at bay, but it created a distortion in the Akashic field surrounding the Earth. Although the main library of Akasha does not have a location in time and space. This area above Earth's atmosphere constituted a portal into the Akashic. This is one of the reasons retrieving information during this time period has been so difficult. Another important factor to consider here, and one that has been written about in your books, is the quarantine that went into effect after the destruction of Lemuria. Because the vibratory level of humans had dropped so significantly, Earth was no longer considered a safe and desirable place on which to settle peaceful loving groups. To prevent the Orions and Draconians from corrupting astral and etheric civilizations on neighbouring worlds, a force field was put into place by the 7th density Pleiadeans to keep Earth's business confined to Earth. This veil was not lifted until approximately 1987 AD, the time known as Harmonic Convergence. Once Earth's instability settled down after the destruction of Lemuria, the Draconians landed and attempted to proliferate, but had a hard time in their reptilian bodies. They then resorted to incarnating through the surviving Lemurians on a relatively stable landmass in what is now the Atlantic Ocean. At the same time, groups of Pleiadeans saw the opportunity to once again settle the Earth, and they came as well despite the quarantine. The councils of Rigel and Betelguise from Orion also came, 
and they found the atmosphere of the Earth nearly ideal for rapid proliferation. The DNA of the survivors was now primarily Orion, with some Syrian, Andromedan and Draconian energy as well. As the new civilization began to emerge, the Pleiadian, Orion and Draconian DNA began to mutate, and the new beings became more scientific and intellectual in their evolution. Thus began the first period of Atlantis. These humans still had the reptilian brain, but their cerebral cortex also contained elements of higher Pleiadian virtues and understanding. A civilization began to develop that is very much like the one that exists today, with all manner of technological achievements. The higher Pleiadian mind combined with the passion of the Orions and the competition of the Draconians resulted in a structured world of machines and great architecture. Michael and his legions, having been humbled by their mistakes of times past, once again tried to influence the more evolved souls of Atlantis. The councils of Rigel, having backed off during Earth's instability, once again took an interest in what was happening in addition to the large numbers of their people incarnating into human form, they maintained a presence in spacecraft above the Atlantean continent. Obviously the quarantine had not worked, and once again Earth was a magnet for all sorts of savoury and unsavoury characters. The first period of Atlantis came to a partial halt during the end of the Grand Cycle in approximately 50,000 BC. However, the civilization was rebuilt, and the final period of Atlantis began. There is much fairly accurate information about Atlantis in several of your channeled writings, including the works of Alice Bailey and Edgar Case. We will not duplicate that effort. We will say, however, that the downfall of the second Atlantis occurred in about 23,200 BC, and was due to the misuse of crystalline energy generation systems. We will give a brief accounting of how this transpired. About 2000 years before the end of Atlantis, the Atlanteans developed radionics, devices using quartz crystals. They were able to generate all the energy they needed for virtually every part of their civilization. This energy was powerful enough to tempt the unsavoury aspects of the society. Several Atlantean scientists made deals with Orion groups orbiting the Earth, trading technology in an attempt to gain superiority. This is similar to what is occurring today between certain Earth factions and the Zeta Reticulins. The Orion-based insurgents wanted greater and greater power from the energy-generating crystals, and they began engineering them to be used as weapons. They never got the chance to wage war because one of the particularly strong crystal generators exploded, sinking the continent and most of her inhabitants. Only a tiny handful escaped in airships, and an even smaller number in seagoing vessels. Over 90% of those that tried to escape by sea were drowned in massive tsunamis. Those that fled in airships relocated to what is now Central and South America, as well as Egypt. This channel has discovered that nearly all of the people he works with in past life remembrance and healing sessions had an integral part in the downfall of Atlantis. We, the founders, remained largely in observation mode as usual during this period. It was our perception that what really destroyed Atlantis was an imbalance between the head and the heart. The scientifically orientated hybrids of the Atlantean period had once again suppressed their emotions in a manner similar to the Luciferians, and in so doing, most Atlanteans lost their ability to discern between energies that were supportive of spiritual growth and those that merely led to the accumulation of physical, astral, and etheric power. Had the inhabitants of Atlantis been balanced in their emotional or mental bodies, they would have seen what was happening and been able to take steps to prevent it. 
we see a similar scenario being played out in your modern world today. We will say that you are very close to where you were at the time of the destruction of Atlantis. However, there are two important differences. The Divine Dispensation is allowing a large number of souls to awaken to higher states of consciousness today. And there are many benevolent ET groups that are closely monitoring the state of affairs on your world and will act in an instant to prevent large-scale nuclear war. In addition, these groups have sophisticated technologies that can detect exotic and unusual weapons before they are tested. We have not yet covered a very important part of your history, that of the Egyptian, Biblical and Greek periods. There is another player in the drama that forcefully shaped the cultures emerging after Atlantis, and that was the Syrians. The so-called battle between light and dark continued after the destruction of Atlantis. Your world seemed to seesaw between periods of brief enlightenment, followed by times of corruption and relative darkness. Egypt was a case in point. A group of seventh density Pleiadians determined to restore the blueprint of humanity, long lost to Orion, Drago, Syrian, Andromedan and other renegade groups took advantage of the fact that the few survivors of Atlantis were relatively pure in heart and mind. Those that landed along the Nile River were the first to be visited by the Pleiadian Welcoming Committee. This contingent was headed by a teacher later named Thoth, who, contrary to ancient writings, did not have the head of a bird or reptile. The creature depicted as such was a Draco-Andromedan hybrid, who came along much later and corrupted the teachings of Thoth. Thoth was a radiant being of blue, white, light, a humanoid with similar colour and energy to ourselves in the higher realms. He was able to step his vibration down far enough to communicate directly with the descendants of Atlantis and teach them in the ways of truth cooperation, harmony, and higher mathematics. As many channeled writings will confirm, Thoth was the engineer behind the Great Pyramid. This device served several purposes, but its primary function was an ascension chamber and controller of Earth's grid system. As correctly pointed out by your Egyptologists, it was aligned with Mintaka, the central star in Orion's belt. Mintaka became the central point in Orion's enlightened government following the resolution of the rigel betelguese Wars about 100,000 years ago. Mintaka also had geographical and geological significance in that it indicated a central axis point of Earth's precession of grand cycles occurring every 25,920 years, approximately. The grid system of Earth was correlated with the point at Giza being the center of the grid, and ley lines and vortexes coming off at various sacred geometric angles therefrom. The Martians during their heyday had a similar grid system constructed at the same latitude and longitude on their planet, also engineered by 7th density Pleiadians. But alas, it never achieved its potential as a portal for ascension due to interference from Orion and Draco factions. Another strategic purpose of the Great Pyramid was to serve as an incoming portal for groups of Pleiadians, so that the purity and vision of the original blueprint would have a fighting chance of getting re-established on Earth. Thoth and his group had a fair degree of success in working with the Atlanteans to construct temples of initiation and soul evolution along the banks of the Nile. Of the several thousand Atlanteans who made this area their home, a significant percentage took part in the ascension activities and initiations in the Great Pyramid. The seventh density Pleiadians constructed the device in a matter of days, using levitation and laser technology. 
A series of passageways were designed to accommodate those who needed extended periods inside the device in order to accelerate their ascension templates in preparation for moving into fifth density light bodies. The subterranean chambers beneath the Giza Plateau were already inhabited by those who had escaped underground during previous conflagrations. The Pleiadians, in concert with these underground groups, established the Hall of Records several thousand feet below the Great Pyramid. The Sphinx was later erected by another group of Egyptians to mark the entrance to the portal. The pyramid was completed in approximately 10,500 BC. It has only been in the last 20 years that scientists on your world have correctly dated the Great Pyramid. Until recently, it was assumed this device was linked to various other pyramids that were constructed using the labour of the Egyptian people to serve as tombs for the pharaohs. Accounts from adepts of the original mystery schools of Thoth can be found sporadically in various stone tablets and channeled writings, including the emerald tablets. Essentially, they document the initiations given to prepare the fourth density souls for ascension into fifth density. Ancient Egypt thrived until 7,500 BC, at which time seventh density Syrians from the Sirius B star system arrived on the scene and began unraveling the work of Thoth and his group. The Christian, Jewish and Greek legends and myths are all about the Syrians. Although these ET factions had great technological and psychic power, they had not resolved their egoic issues satisfactorily and as a result became infatuated with worship and praise by their underlings. In other words, they were on a guru trip, to quote a popular phrase. At first, it was subtle. They demonstrated their miraculous powers to those who did not have the spiritual understanding to see through the charade. As they intermingled and interbred, the DNA of the descendants became more and more polluted with their brand of egoistic messiahship. The mystery schools began to devolve into pecking orders and devotion to Syrian gods. The god of the Old Testament, Jehovah, was a seventh density Syrian. Those of you familiar with Jehovah's teachings, but unwilling to accept the premise that Jehovah was an egotistical Syrian, should examine the result of Jehovah's presence on the earth. As stated many times by this channel, the Old Testament is one of the bloodiest and most violent books ever written. Would a highly evolved, enlightened being pit one race against another? Would he order blind obedience to his principles? Would he exalt some over others? In God's universe, there are no elite or chosen ones. Everyone is chosen and is created in pure love and innocence. Everyone has equal value in the eyes of God, and that value is infinite. Biblical scholars, Jewish and Christian clerics on your world, need to go back to basics and examine the results of ancient teachings. Did they promote peace and evolution of awareness, or did they promote division and conflict? We the founders seldom preach, but this point is too important to let pass. Now, on with the show. We return you to Egypt during its fall into worship and sacrifice. At the same time as the Syrian invasion, after 7,500 BC, the Orions and Dracos began arriving on the scene, and a degree of interbreeding ensued, resulting in many of the part reptilian, part avian, part human forms depicted in later Egyptian drawings. The bird people were a hybrid Draco Andromedan race, the result of creative DNA engineering, and they attempted to land their native forms on the Earth with partial success. They, like the Syrians, used their superior technology and psychic powers to enslave the docile inhabitants of Egypt. 
you can find drawings of the Syrian and Draco Andromedan gods on the walls of caves throughout Egypt. The pure in heart and mind, seeing the experiment once again go awry, sadly retreated back to the inner plains, and a period of relative darkness descended over Egypt. The ritual sacrifices, mummies, and mystery schools of the pharaohs were all the manifestation of Syrian, Orion, Draco, and Andromedan corruption of the original Pleiadian teachings. Had the teachings of Thoth been fully integrated by his students, they would never have been corruptible. The lesson here should be obvious by now. Unless you have fully integrated your ego and higher consciousness, you can be led astray by seemingly well-meaning teachers who themselves have not integrated their egos with spirit. At this time, we wish to illuminate your minds regarding the real story of Jesus Christ. It is important to note that the allegorical storyline of one being sacrificed to heal the sins of the masses did not originate with the events 2,000 years ago, but is a theme that has been repeated many times throughout history, long before the man you know as Jesus was carried to the cross. If you dig into the history of different cultures, you will find other such icons whose stories are very similar to that of Jesus. The idea that a saviour died for your sins, and the playing out of that drama in a form similar to Jesus is an attempt by the Dark Lords to get humanity to place the blame outside of themselves in order to keep their problems from being solved. Let's get this straight. Nobody can ever die for your sins, beloveds. That is for two reasons. First, you have free will and are responsible for everything you do, and second, there is no such thing as an unpardonable error or an error that causes you to be defective. You are as perfect as the day God created you, and you will always be perfect and innocent and holy. Lord Sonada, in his book set A Course in Miracles, made that very clear. There are some factual aspects to the story as told in the New Testament of the Bible, but there are many distortions. Allow us to elaborate. The soul known as Jesus was a direct fragment of the Sonada lineage. In other words, Sonada was the oversoul of Jesus. Sonada having watched as humankind once again floundered in sorrow and ignorance, and having a desire to intervene in the affairs of man in a way that respected free will, incarnated in approximately 39 BC as the son of Joseph and Mary. This much is in general agreement with the biblical story. Jesus' birth date was approximately March 31st. Lord Sonada, an eighth density celestial being, incarnated as Yeshua or Joshua, depending on whose translation you use. Being from the eighth density, he retained many of his spiritual abilities, despite the very dense environment he was born into. As a young child, he was very psychic and foresaw many of the events that would later come to pass. Mary and Joseph were at odds with the political establishment to some degree, and they were not married when Mary became pregnant. The virgin birth story is made up. Certain ET factions have the capabilities of impregnating women without going through normal sexual means, but in this case, Yeshua came in through normal means. To avoid the social and political consequences of giving birth out of wedlock, and to remove themselves from the oppressive beliefs of the authorities, Mary and Joseph migrated toward Galilee, and eventually near the Dead Sea, where they briefly took refuge with the Essenes. Mary and Joseph left Yeshua in their care and returned to Galilee, Yeshua later joined the SNE order. He spent three years building temples and housing for the Essenes while attending their sacred teachings and learning the Essenine way. Along the banks of the Dead Sea, Yeshua learned to have respect for Mother Earth and 
had a hand in helping bring the much needed rain scarce in that region. The Essenes were strict vegetarians and taught a respect for all life forms. They were regarded as strange and antisocial by the governments of the land, but were left largely alone, as they seemed to pose no threat, always paid their taxes, even though they did not believe in such matters. When Yeshua turned about 16, he and a fellow group of Essenese travelled east to India, where he met several Indian gurus and saints. He studied for about two years with a guru who taught him a great deal about the mysteries of life. When he returned, and during a dangerous visit to see his parents in Galilee, he met and fell in love with Mary Magdalene, who was a dancer and entertainer and only very briefly prostituted herself when times were tough. Mary M and Yeshua were deeply in love with each other and had a child. Because they were not married, they too became social outlaws. Some of Yeshua's s &E friends allowed Mary M to stay at the temples with Yeshua against the rules of the elders. Yeshua, Mary M and their young son travelled to India a second time where the child was blessed by the gurus. Word got out that Mary M had an illegitimate child, although nobody seemed to know the father outside of the Essenese. Fearing for the child's life, Mary M and Yeshua left the child temporarily in the care of an Indian saint and returned to Galilee. It was a few years later before they could return to India, and although they missed their son terribly, they knew he was alright. Mary M and Yeshua paid another visit to their son a few years later, but he remained in the care of the Indian saints when they returned. The political climate was too unstable to risk bringing the child back with them to Galilee. Despite the short time they spent with their son, their influence helped him greatly as he grew up in India. Their son became a wise sage and his teachings added significantly to the climate of India. Yeshua received several visions from spirit and his soul family and was told to teach higher spiritual principles to anyone who would listen sincerely. He began teaching earnestly in his late twenties and gathered quite a following. At one point, he had about 50 disciples. He and Mary M kept their relationship and child a complete secret, not even discussing this with the closest disciples. Being highly clairvoyant, Yeshua saw that the authorities would eventually kill him, but he was told by his own God self to stay his course and teach as many people as possible the ways of spirit. Yeshua's teachings were highly distorted in the Bible, but a few truths managed to get through. He taught that we are all created in the image and likeness of our creator, and that we all have the abilities he demonstrated. He taught us to love one another and to forgive our enemies. He did not teach that the way to God was through him alone. Several of his disciples learned how to use their spiritual gifts of healing and clairvoyance, and there are ample stories in the Bible of John going on to perform similar healings. The story of Yeshua's involvement in the Melchizedek priesthood is also in the Bible, in Hebrews chapter 7. Once Yeshua reached a certain level of awareness, his cosmic family in the celestial realms began communicating with him and reminding him of his position within the Melchizedek priesthood. When Yeshua was brought to the cross, he immediately left his body consciously instead of suffering three days as is taught erroneously. During his life, he continually forgave them for they knew not what they did. After leaving his body, he holographically projected himself back into human form to appear to his disciples and Mary M on numerous occasions. The body left the tomb because grave robbers stole it. He had no need to resurrect it as he was already able to materialize a new body once he returned to eighth density. Lord Sonada has fragmented his soul several more times throughout history. At the present time, 
there are eight fragments of Sonada on the earth. Some of these souls believe they are Jesus, and to a certain extent they are correct. Many great souls are capable of fragmenting themselves dozens of times in order to do service work on lower density planets. Usually over souls fragment into 12 souls at a time, but this is not set in stone. Many fragments remain in the higher densities to guide the fragments in the lower worlds. The term fragment does not mean incomplete or partial. Each of these fragments is a complete and sovereign being. This channel uses the cell dividing analogy to explain this in his writings. The second coming of Christ refers to the return to Christ consciousness or the celestial consciousness of higher densities. This was correctly interpreted by your Paramansa Yoganada and many other yogis and saints. As most of you know, traditional Christianity has very little to do with the teachings of Yeshua and a whole lot to do with sin and guilt. Fortunately, many souls are expanding their awareness beyond these primitive beliefs. We the founders are grateful to see so many truly doing the greater works that Yeshua taught. During this brief look at the work of Yeshua, we only touch briefly on Mary M and the Divine Feminine and spoke hardly a word about Mother Mary. There are numerous channeled articles on these beings and we do not wish to duplicate the information. We hope we have set the record straight on the lifetime of the one you call Jesus.